Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Joe Fassler, Deputy Editor of The Counter, a nonprofit newsroom covering the business, politics, and culture of American food. You probably know this already, but this channel, it, this panel is the future of grocery retail. It's the second in a series of events for Nyman Ranch, Nyman Ranch's 22nd annual hog farmer appreciation celebration. Nyman Ranch has organized a series of events featuring luminaries like Michael Pollan and Dr. Temple Grandin, as well as virtual farm tours, chef and farmer panels, and more, all to celebrate their network of independent family farmers. Visit Nyman Ranch, FAD.com for more information. So for this event, we're gonna be talking about the dramatic ways that grocery shopping behavior has changed this year, digging into what changes are temporary, which are with us for the long term, and what this means for the farming community. Throughout the panel, I encourage you all to put your questions in the comments section, and towards the end, or the, the little chat room there, and towards the end, we'll have our guests try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, so I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have a, a really amazing group here to talk about uh, the grocery sector and, and just the, the, tr the truly astonishing uh, changes we've seen um, over the past months. And by do uh, I thought the way we could do that um, though this panel will be about trends with staying power, you know, things that are going to stick around and how we might emerge from this change. Um, I'd like to just hear a little bit about everyone's last six months. So when you um, introduce yourself, uh, just tell us a little bit about what you've gone through through the lens of your work, um, even if it's obviously temporary, even if it's obviously, you know, emergency measures. Um, that could be a good way of setting the stage for the conversations that we're going to have about longer term trends. So let's start with uh, Kevin Kelly, who's the principal co-founder of the architectural design firm Shook Kelly. I had the pleasure of, um, of profiling Kevin's work last year. And, and Kevin, one thing that was really interesting in that piece, which was called uh, The Man Who's Going to Save Your Neighborhood Grocery Store, is we talked so much about strategies that uh, you know, regional grocers can use to get people in the door. You know, whether it's putting a restaurant in the grocery or, you know, or, or focusing on, on all these exciting uh, ways to make people want to gather in a place. Well, that's really gone out the window uh, in the past months. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and let's just hear a little bit about what your clients um, have, have been seeing. Thank you, Joe. And thank you guys for letting me be involved in this. Uh, my name is Kevin Kelly. As Joe said, I'm a principal and co-founder of a firm called Shook Kelly. Um, we're architects and we also are graphic designers and merchandising designers and uh, brand strategists and we develop new prototype stores for grocery stores. Um, what we've seen in the last six months has been fascinating because our whole business is about convening consumers in place and helping uh, typically regional or local grocery stores differentiate themselves through experience or through social engagement and that's all been changing. Um, we've, we've had a lot of issues with things like self-service salad bars, olive bars, wine bars, cafes. These are all critical factors that help differentiate the local grocery store from say the giant grocery store chains that have so much buying power and, and kind of investment potential and capacity. And so we've had to look at a lot of changes, uh, particularly within the store environment. Um, at the same time, there's kind of been this uh, desire or, or fear of coming together. We also see a pent up demand that people are trying to find ways to come back out. And so we already see there's big demand for people to come together because as soon as we took out the salad bars, we had a lot of complaints from consumers and that's just one of many examples. So uh, it's gonna be interesting. Um, uh, the one thing that I'm sure we're gonna talk about today is uh, e-commerce is certainly taken off and familiarized a lot of people that were not familiar with it and kind of gotten them comfortable. So uh, the world we're getting ready to go into is definitely going to be different, but I don't think it's as black or white as maybe, it, maybe it's always presented out there. I think you're gonna see some interesting models and probably the biggest difference between buying, which is more transaction-based and shopping, which is more leisure-based and experience-based. And I think you're still gonna have both activities. Yeah. Uh, but they're just going to separate into two different areas. Thanks so much, Kevin. So our next guest is uh, Mark Jonah, who's the co-founder of Plum Market. And, and Plum is positioned in, in a really interesting way. I'll, I'll let you talk about that, Mark. But, you, you know, you guys do have an e-commerce channel uh, or, a, you know, online channels that's, that's very strong and, and well-positioned, as well as 
you know, the physical stores. Um, so yeah, just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how, how your work has, has been impacted over the past months. Sure, I'm Mark Jonah, a co-founder of Plum Market. Started our company over 13 years ago with my brother, Matt. So independent grocer in the Detroit area, Chicago, and soon to be in Washington, DC. So uh, we are in the bricks and mortar stores, like grocery stores, as you just said, Joe, but also in the e-commerce business and now drive up and delivery, which is becoming a big thing during COVID. So when people don't want to shop in the store, they still want the great products. So they want the convenience of getting it. So technology has played a big role. Um, earlier, um, we, I was asked by Kevin, you know, did you want to do those things now or what happened? Uh, were you already doing them? And I said, no, when this happened, we just took everything on turbo blast. So we launched things that would take six months, two weeks. Amazing. Uh, we work 24 seven with our teams and uh, it's been an amazing experience. And I think through adversity is when you really learn the true culture and the true um, determination of your team members and your guests to support you and your vendors. So it's been an amazing um, and unbelievable experience of the last six months. It's something I would never have imagined in any movie ever produced. And I thought it was the most fiction I've ever watched. So I think still feel like we're in the, you know, we're, we're still in the first act and we're trying to figure it out, but, you know, really proud of our vendors like Nyman Ranch, our amazing team members we call superheroes right now uh, being on the front line and um, also you know just just staying staying with the time so it's really a, a great time to really talk about it and kind of share different experiences with, with everybody on this panel and really thank you for making me part of this panel yeah thanks so much mark and a, a lot to follow up there as the conversation goes forward um next uh i'll introduce chris uh, Dubois, who's SVP of Protein Practice at IRI, and, and Chris is a great person to have on the panel because, you know, you're really looking at the sort of bird's eye view, um, you know, data focused uh, side of things. And, and that'll help, I, I think, put some, some teeth into this conversation that goes beyond, you know, the, the, the sort of lived experience of, of some of the retailers and other experts on here. Um, so Chris, why don't you go ahead and, and um, you know, tell us a, a little bit about the changes you've seen over the past months. Oh, thanks, Joe. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I hope, um, really looking forward to working with this group here. We had had a warm up um, last week, and it was it was fantastic. So I know you'll get a lot out of the conversations. Um, IRI is at a very unique uh, part of the industry. So every day we see eight sales in eighty percent of the supermarkets across the U.S. at item level. And we pull in 500 million frequent shopper cards. So while IRI is not a household term for a lot of people, and a lot of people in the audience may not know who we are, um, we're, the, we're the data that fuels the industry. So we get a kind of a day-by-day -day snapshot, and you can go to our website to see it. One of the things we did as a company was speed up everything we do. So our data now comes out daily. Um, but you know, part of that was just in response to, to retailers like Mark and, and um, our manufacturer clients, processor clients, um, it's a big deal. So when we see the major changes taking place in supermarkets, you know, sales up in the meat department, 90%. I mean, just think about, just wrap your head around that. Total US meat went up 90% mid-March. It's, it's really an unbelievable number. And even the, today it's tracking 15 to 20% up um, on sales dollars. Total supermarket sales about the same. And we've seen that big return to for people not only because they've had to be at home, but they're they're cooking more. So the typical recipe rotations you see in a household of seven to twelve recipes, it's expanded, and you can see it across the meat department um, categories like lamb, bison, some of the exotics. Um, turkeys had a phenomenal run. You know, just areas that have been very slower growth are now doing extremely well, and you know that's very different from what I've talked about for the last four years. So as people return to um, cooking more um, in the households, they're using new methods new, and um, experimenting. And it's, you can see it across the store, whether that's in big auto stops or big sales growth patterns, um, we're seeing major trends pull forward. Yeah, that would have taken till say 2025 to hit. You know, so Kevin talked about e-commerce and you know, we're sort of at the point of where we're at in 2025. Um, 
so the changes in the, the size and scope of this kind of impact on the supermarket industry has really just been something I've not seen in 30 years. And it's, it's been just a, uh, just a phenomenal change in terms of how important you know, both the products and the, and the stores are to people in their daily lives. And I think that's, that's come back in a very big way as well. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, it, it does seem like we've kind of gone in warp speed into the future. You know, everyone said e-commerce is coming, but but um, some of these these things that you know uh, retailers like Mark have had to sort of develop overnight or really just insist on just to get by. You know, they may, may stick around. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, next is uh, Michael Seguero, who's founder of ButcherBox, and and Mike, you. Um, you know, of the people here, you, you may work most directly with, uh, you know, with meat um, producers, um, though, though, though everyone has some, some uh, interactions with, with that uh, class of, of supplier. Um, but, but tell us a bit about your work and, and what you've seen. Yeah, sure. So uh, I run butcherbox.com. Um, we ship uh, what we call claims-based meat in the mail, usually on a monthly subscription. We've been around for five years. Uh, this is my third uh, annual uh, farmer appreciation. I'm really bummed we're not doing a dinner because that's like awesome. So I, I really wish I was in Iowa right now. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, once when COVID hit in the beginning of March, um, we saw what everyone saw, which was an extreme acceleration of demand. Um, and we saw it on two fronts. We saw it from uh, existing subscribers, existing customers who are trying to get more meat faster. So maybe they didn't believe that we would be able to keep shipping them a box. So they were like, I want it now. Um, and we also saw just a huge spike in uh, new customers um, to the point where we actually shut off our website to new customers because we were worried about our ability to procure enough meat for our current customers. And uh, one of our core values is member obsessed. So we, we wanted to make sure our current customers were um, well stocked. Um, and on the production side, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a struggle. Uh, uh, basically, COVID has gone through a number of plants um, in, in one way, shape, or form. Everyone's had to slow down their line speed, um, which means less animals can be processed, which means they're backing up in other places in the supply chain. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's that we're not out of the woods by any means on that. I think uh, right now is, you know, things are decently better, um, uh, but, we're, we're nowhere close to being um, back to where we, where we want to be. Um, I think as far as uh, the, the business goes, you know, we work with um, animals raised like Nyman animals are raised across multiple proteins. And the other thing that we've seen is a real flight to quality. Um, so we found customers and it could be because there's a real health scare or, um, you know, they're really focusing on their health more or because of the cooking, but we're seeing, um, Claims-based, uh, you know, I go around to in some communities and claims-based is considered kind of this niche thing over here that isn't really a thing, just like e-commerce. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh, e-commerce is here in a big way and claims-based is here in a big way. And um, I've joked with my team, while we would never wish uh, the pandemic on, on, on the world, um, really the we could not have found more perfect conditions for a company like ours that really stands for you know, the, the animal and humane treatment for the animal and treating the farmer well, um, and also delivering conveniently to people's doorstep. Uh, that, that's really certainly been appreciated. Um, and um, yeah, it's been, I mean, it's been a wild ride to everyone. I'm sure it's just been a crazy wild ride. Every day is a new piece of information. Uh, things that are totally non-linear to where you, like what you would expect to happen, happen. It's just been a, it's been a really, uh, I would say agility is the number one thing that has been uh, important during this time for all sorts of brands and retailers and grocery stores, et cetera. Thanks so much. Yeah, and I think there's so much there to follow up on as well. Um, maybe we could just start by talking about um, behavior going forward. So, you know, we, we've talked about, uh, you know, curbside and click and collect and some of these things that may be new for many brick and mortar uh, retailers, um, even some of them trying to work in their new e-commerce, maybe home delivery. Um, how have we seen, what do we think is kind of hitting a chord that may be going beyond just this moment? You know, if there's a vaccine or somehow, you know, we're able to really move beyond this um, in the not too distant future. Uh, is there anything that now that, now that we're doing it, 
um, it's like, oh man, you know, the industry should have been doing this all along. It works great for people. And the sort of second wrinkle to that is if there are any of those things that we can identify, do they actually push the customer towards any kinds of specific uh, foods, especially related to meat? I mean, one of the tensions that I'm interested in is between um, just, you know, standard commodity meat, you buy it, you know, because it's meat and you're probably primarily looking at, at price. Um, and of course, e-commerce can be great for that, right? You can shop, you can comparison shop so well online. Um, but then, you know, then the, on the other side, brick and mortar is great about, um, you know, sampling and, and being able to look at it and evaluate, you know, um, or, or, or to the storytelling capacity um, there, whether it's from, a, you know, a, somebody, you know, from, from the farmers in the store giving samples or there's, you know, great advertising um, opportunities. Um, tend to be associated a little bit more with brick and mortar. So I'm, I'm curious both like what, what new patterns of behavior do we think um, might stick around and do they, do they lend themselves well to any kinds of, um, uh, you know, food suppliers uh, in general? And that's just sort of general, I think, for, you know, for everyone to, to maybe think about and respond to. And anyone wanna take that on? Oh, I could start. So in the grocery store, you know, we talked about, you know, people eating more at home and trying different types of meats and recipes. And, you know, the younger generation, like I have three daughters, um, you know, 16, 19, and 22. And they're all really into what they eat, into health, into sustainability, traceability. They, they just know a lot more than when I was their age. And with the internet and with the Food Network and everything that's going on in the world, it was there but you know, people were still not eating as home as much. And when it, we all got, for, of course, the quarantine together, we started to cook every day, multiple meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you saw that the family table was coming back into fruition and people were starting to, to cook more. Even if they knew how to cook before, they're, they're, they're becoming experts now because of necessity. And it's been amazing to see that. And they're driving quality. Uh, we're into the natural organic business. so and local. We love Nyman Ranch and we've been selling it for years because of what we believed in. And when our guests, especially a lot of new guests, are starting to come in and try the different types of meats, and especially Nyman, they're getting hooked and they're, they're tasting the difference. They're feeling emotionally the difference because they know the, the, the taste is emotion, they know the story behind it finally because they Google it or they, they hear something from somebody else that tells them. So it's, it's a great new trend. So Remember you said drive up and delivery, e-com, you know, a less grocery store experience because you, you shop less frequently, but bigger. So your, your basket goes from like 25, 30 to over hundred, sometimes even bigger. And people were buying, as we said earlier, they were buying tons of meats. They all wanted freezers, you know, so they want they were scared we weren't gonna have enough meat. So uh, it was amazing to see it. So I think the way you get groceries might change after COVID, the percentage may, may skew back in terms of drive up and delivery and e-com. You may get um, those slowing up, but they're still gonna be existing. But the long-term trend is people are learning to cook again and that there's quality out there. And I always tease uh, people, you put premium gas in your car, but a lot of people put bad food in their body. And I think it should be the reverse. Yeah, that, that's so interesting. I mean, Kevin, I wonder if you've seen similar, you, you, on the call we had, to prep for this, you mentioned that there's some recipe fatigue. Um, you know, from what Mark was saying, it's almost like the kind of excitement and quality that we look forward to in a you know professionally prepared meal at a restaurant. Now people are maybe trying to uh, approximate at home, you know, by by necessity. But but once they once they try that, you know, you 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 don't lose those skills. You know, maybe we see the value in that. Do you think that there may be some staying power? You know, over the past 30 years, we've seen this constant sort of balance between the, the, the dollar spent on food at retail and the dollar spent on food out, you know, and food service. And it's kind of um, been, a, you know, a, a bit of a, a balancing act who's ahead there. Do you think this may, this experience may, in the longer term way, um, sort of tip the scales towards folks cooking more? Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of beautiful in a way, if you think about it, it, it's a pendulum and it swings back and forth. And prior to COVID, we certainly had this everybody, well, younger generations eating out, having food delivered. 
um, actually not sitting down in restaurants. That's the fascinating thing. In 2016, more food dollars were eaten at home, but not from the grocery store. And the grocery store wasn't benefiting from that. Restaurants were benefiting from that. And part of that drive is millennials are gourmet focused and they've made gourmet a, a mainstream. It's no longer it's no longer a specialty item. It's what they want every day. And you see that with coffee behavior, six, seven dollar coffees every day that older generations would have never even considered. Um, and so th there's been a premiumization of food and a quality of food and, and story of food. I, I think the bigger idea that sometimes gets missed in this, and it's very easy for all of us to miss this, is that uh, since the beginning of time, food serves very symbolic meaning issues and we need food with meaning. Uh, it's what brings us together, it's what bonds us and we need variety. In our food and we need story in our food and you know just just if you look at all the language and meaning around breaking bread and what that does to us or making a toast or having a drink or celebration th these are all very important traditions and rituals that won't go away and this temporary situation with COVID created a fear-based mentality so there was a a lot of concern about sustenance and just being able to survive but as we pull out of that people are going to be looking for food with meaning I think, I think what it's shown is the cracks in the grocery store. The grocery store was built on a Model T chassis and we've been constantly trying to build that same idea, perimeter, center store, front end checkout. These are not at the convenience of the consumers. This is the convenience of the warehouse distribution packout system. It is not what consumers want. And the thing that we've really learned right now is we don't like to work. We don't like to schlep stuff but we do like to experience food and we do like menu ideas and, and we want to get away from menu fatigue. And we're in touch with consumers every day for the work we do. And we, we hear chefs, we hear gourmands in the home saying, I don't know if I can eat another meal that I'm making myself. And so we're really excited about what this might mean. Can you imagine if we just took out the actual work components of a grocery store for a consumer? And they said, well, we're not going to make you wait in line. We're not gonna make you, you know, go through an hour and a half experience. But what if we increase the delight aspects, the meaning aspects? And so I'm kind of excited about what's, what's coming up and what's out there for us. But I do think it requires getting rid of the dinosaur chassis and, and really rethinking what a grocery store should and could be. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to talk more about that and, you know, um, opportunities for storytelling, uh, especially, you know, online. Um, or, or if that really, you know, has to happen more um, in in place, you know, when we when we are able to do that better. But before we do, Chris, I'm I'm just wondering, you know, just in terms of the sort of retail data that you look at, the, the vast volume of that, um, you know, we all saw the this, this, uh, sort of temporary shortages in the beginning. Um, we saw the people stocking up their meat freezers or buying meat freezers for the first time. Now is that starting to shake out a little bit? And, and as it does, are we starting to see, you know, some, some changes in the, in the way people um, buy food or, or the, the proportion of foods that they buy and in a way that you think might stick around or is it, is it too soon to tell? I think since March, we've seen a very good stabilization, at least of numbers across the total store. So it's it's run high. You know, sales have been great. If you see results from most retailers, they've done extremely well. Um, but the big takeaway, I think, is consumers are just shopping differently, and it, it's likely to persist over time. So what we're seeing is people making shorter trips into the store, but they're buying more when they're doing it. So in other words, that weekly stock up trip may not take an hour, they wanna be in and out in half an hour. So as a result, they're being very particular about what they go after. Um, so they're looking for the retailers that are in stock on the right kind of products, or they're looking for the categories that make a difference. And so when a consumer does pick that store, you know, think about fewer trips, but buying more, you know, that those retailers are really winning big. So we're starting to see the separation now between retailers as well as manufacturers about, um, in the category side. So the manufacturers that can stay in stock can make sure the retailers have the right kind of products. Um, yeah, you know, the out of stocks are still kind of there, especially in the meat department. Um, it's not as bad as it used to be. There's not the, you know, dramatic, gee, there's nothing here except for plant-based foods. Um, pictures that you might see in USA Today and others, but um, that's the separation's really happening across the store. 
So, and what I mean by separation is, I mean, some manufacturers may be up 10 to 15%, some are down 10 to 15% simply because of that factor. Um, we're also seeing just a, a, a ton of new buyers coming into categories. So I, I would just kind of want a, a national brand sausage company comes to mind, but they're still a small regional player. 750,000 new buyers came into their category that had never bought their product before. So what you're seeing now from a, a retail side and the marketing side is just probably the most important moment from a food marketing side that we've had in 25 years. And it's simply because there are so many new buyers coming in, the, re, the manufacturers that can retain those are gonna win in a big way. And that's differential marketing. It's focused on equity and knowing who your buyers are um, to put that in place. I, I expect to see more share shifts going forward. Yeah. And then finally, e-commerce, you know, uh, Kevin, you touched on it, Mark, you touched on it as well. And yeah, you know, this is something when you see it growing 80 to 100%, this, the retailers that win these weeks are winning in a very big way. And the same thing for manufacturers trying to make sure they're on that list. That loss of a brick and mortar trip means it's harder for brands to be seen that aren't primary in people's minds. So if you're a second or third or fourth tier brand, it becomes a lot harder to get on that shoppers list to get their attention, to have them put it on there because they're used to buying a certain brand or a certain item. Um, so I think we're going to see a shakeout for the manufacturers at some point here. of Who's really getting behind and helping drive business at the retail level and who's been sort of coasting on, um, you know, over the years on, on hardcore trade promotions yeah. um, on that bit. It's interesting. I mean, I'm curious how, you know, obviously people who, Nyman's ta target audience, I think, is, is um, you know, the, the customer who is looking at more uh, than price and is looking for a more holistic story, you know, a story yeah. about, about values and, and animals and, and the land. Um, and, uh, and maybe the, those things are, are worth, you know, paying a little more for. Um, uh, I'm curious, you know, Mike, uh, you don't operate any physical stores you, you've in a way you've always uh existed within this paradigm that some retailers are now finding themselves challenged with for the first time where they don't have you know they don't have end caps and they don't have trade promotions um or the ability to really grab the customer's attention in the same way because everyone's so focused on getting in and getting out as we've heard or you know only stocking up once in a while um what have you learned just from your experience of being in e-commerce, e which I think we tend to think of Amazon when we think of e-commerce, you know, it can, it can sound a little cold. Uh, it can sound a little more sort of inhuman and transactional. I think, you know, that's the cliche, um, but you, you know, you're selling claims based meat, as you said, you're trying, you're a storyteller. You're trying to um, give people like the special option, you know, the thing that they might buy and be excited about because of how good it is. Um, what have you seen, what opportunities do you have there in terms of storytelling um, for folks who are for the first time finding themselves having to deal with the kind of e-commerce landscape? Yeah, so the stat that I've heard that I think is like the most telling is that the average person spends 13 seconds in front of the meat case in a grocery store, 13 seconds. So this idea that you're gonna be able to tell a story, explain to them what all these different labels and you know uh, numbers mean, uh, explain to them what grass fed means. It, it, it's just, it's basically impossible. People are utilitarian shoppers and they're looking for what they, what they want. That's only exacerbated by COVID. I mean, when I go to the grocery store, I put my mask on, I go in, I grab whatever's on the list. I don't look at anything else. I don't look at anybody and I get out. And that's, that's here to stay, right? So um, the, the notion that you can't store it, like you need a grocery store to story tell, I, I think actually online is a way do way more rich storytelling online in a way that people feel engaged by in a way that I think is here to stay. Um, you know, I think uh, you, going back to what do we think sticks, um, we looked pretty early on at, uh, at China uh, during SARS in 2003. So SARS, um, China's retail penetration uh, before COVID was about triple the United States' retail penetration. And the, the, the research shows that the jump really happened in SARS. So SARS in 2003 was a big deal in China. Everyone was quarantined to their house. Everyone started shopping online and it's never gone backwards. So it's only gone up, right? And so I would argue that e-commerce and the way in which people are shopping now is going to stay. I mean, th th that's the only data point we have out there. And I like to find data points and then you know, try to apply them to today. The only data point we have is that's here to stay. 
I think the other thing that's interesting with grocery is, of course, online is uh, interesting and is a competitor to grocery. But let's not forget the massive increase that's happened in, from, from people who are traditionally eating out who are now willing to cook a meal. And so we look at habits, right? We look at if somebody nails a meal, right? If somebody figures out Taco Tuesday and now that's part of their, their weekly thing, that's one more meal that the grocery store is going to pick up that, um, that the you know, traditional going out or ordering in uh, is no longer going to have. And I believe that will stay too. I think people have found a new joy in cooking and that's, that's here to stay. That's not going to leave. So personally, I think grocery is going to have a big climb. E-commerce, e e yes, to figure it out. But certainly the, uh, if I have to um, you know, uh, order food out and worry about that or just cook, I'm, I'm gonna cook. Um, and finally, uh, I guess two other points. There, there was a week in, uh, I think it was April, where the price of a tenderloin, right? So like a filet, a filet, which people would have at a steakhouse was almost at the same price as conventional meat. It was almost at the same price as a chuck roast. So when you think about like, what are people doing? They're no longer going to steakhouses. They're trying to figure out how to cook a chuck roast for the first time. And that's just like a, you know, a mind blowing kind of that. And then that totally changes the, the, the cutout of the animal, which caused a bunch of problems. Um, and then finally, um, we like to look at like what are other indicators of what may happen. The only indicator I've been able to find, and this is like brand new information, um, Melbourne, Australia. Uh, so Melbourne just went back. They just went back into quarantine. Uh, shelves were cleared. People like, the, I think the, the, the question in my mind is not, is coronavirus here for longer? Is it gonna get worse in the fall? I, I think yes and yes. Um, the, I think the question is, do people start panic buying again? Because that's what we saw. We saw like real fear causing people to purchase. And, um, you know, the only data point we have thus far are places that are in their second wave or are starting to see, you know, starting to move backwards. And thus far, it appears that it's going to be more of the same where the shelves will be cleared again. Yeah. So interesting. Th thanks for all those comments. I mean, you know, one thing that makes me think of is, as we know, you know, demand for food is maybe more or less fixed. That's the conventional wisdom. Although the panic buying, you know, it shows that maybe not to be totally true because I think people were buying more food for a while there. Um, but, it, you know, if you if you sort of take for granted the cliche that the demand for food is, is sort of a, a zero sum fixed thing, um, maybe there is still room to grow for both e-commerce and the grocery industry because the real loser here, un uh, unfortunately for them is restaurants. Um, and we have been reporting quite a bit on um, how restaurants were trouble e in trouble even before the pandemic um, for a lot of reasons. But obviously now um, we're seeing some really tragic things in, in that sector. So that, that may mean that, that, um, that both grocery and e-commerce are, are, are not necessarily pitted against each other, but both kind of filling up um, the vacancy that's being left by the, by the contraction of the restaurant industry. Yeah, yeah, I, I think thought, that's very fair, Joe, just kind of thinking about it in terms of, of kind of where we see things going. And, you know, it, it, I hate to say it's a forever trend, but it's probably a good one you could bake in for three to five years to say that people have learned to cook at home. And it, that's a big deal. I mean, I've sat around industry association meetings for 20 years of shoot, the supermarket industry and the food industry is always, how do we get people to cook at home, you know? Apparently, the, the answer was a pandemic uh, to go do that because it because it, it's happening. Um, but that pendulum swings the real one for food service. And yeah, I, there's a lot of other people who can talk about the shape of food service on that side. But I think we're seeing at least a 5% shift over. But and you're right that the big, the, uh, at least the big message that we talk about every day is that e-commerce and bricks and mortar work together. It's, it's the retailer's brand, the retailer's trust of how they interact um, with the consumer. That's the opportunity. And, and it's about getting that mix right over time. And it's, it's really not as much about an either or, but just making it more convenient for the customer to shop at the end of the day. Um, yeah. So, I, yeah, so I, part I, of this I, is trying to make sure that both, just understanding both can win is, is a great message. Right, yeah. I think I'd have some comments for both uh, in between both Chris and Mike's comments, which were great. Um, I, I think Mike, the way you described your shopping pattern of getting in and getting out is a type of customer. We videotape customers, we watch customers, and 
Um, and it actually breaks down in terms of age and gender. And many customers don't shop that way. Many customers, uh, men tend to shop very fast and walk at a really fast gait and get in and out. But a lot of customers like to pick products and touch products and read labels. And, um, and it's not so much they can't read labels online. It's just we're sensory based human beings. And we need our, we use our senses to make decisions. In fact, none of our ideas that are in our head uh, they have to first come through our senses. And, and this is a hard wiring thing. And you see this in online purchases because people tend to set up a queue list and then they don't break that norm. No matter what we try to do online, we have a hard time getting them to change their mind. I think what's interesting between your business and Amazon's business is that Amazon is selling a commodity that's a known commodity. And I, I think what you sell is ideas and inspirations and solutions on how to live a better life and how to eat better. And that is what the consumer is really dying for is I need ideas, inspirations and solutions that I'm looking for the editors out there that can bring me those ideas. And a couple of surprising things we've seen, we, we work with you know, 25 different grocery stores, some low price, some high price. Our premium grocery stores are doing great. They're doing double what the traditional grocery stores are doing. So our premium ones are, are fantastic right now. They love this. Um, they are concerned about this standard list of shopping and their consumers are concerned about the standard list of shopping. And so we're trying to figure out how to facilitate that, that particular customer. But the, the thing, and you guys were mentioning about a second surge and other things, we are concerned about not so much just a second surge because I think people are used to that. What happens if we have a food supply scare or a meat scare, something which, you know, we all know the locusts come after the rains. And so that has got people a little bit nervous. And so we have been trying to redesign the grocery stores around this idea of, of cleanliness. And we used to do this in the 70s and 80s. We used to have very sterile stores. And then we went into very uh, gritty, earthy stores. I think you might see a pendulum swing on that. Um, in addition to the home, when Chris mentioned the home, I think it's nice to see that switch back to home. And we are seeing a lot of cocooning. And I mean, you see it with Netflix habits, you see it with board games, um, private parties, all of these things are coming back that way, which was would have happened anyway, by the way. Uh, it's just the nature of our society. We go in and out from bell-bottom jeans, no bell-bottom jeans, skinny jeans, fat jeans. It, this is just kind of the nature of our fashion of our lives. And it does react to things. Yeah, um, yeah. there's one thing I, th that's, Fascinating, Kevin. Thank you. And it's, it's interesting to, to see these trends. You know, I think there's a lot of commonality, you know, between some of your clients and, and, and ButcherBox, even as different as those models are. Yeah. Uh, it's great to see that. Um, yeah. So, you know, one thing I wanted to be sure we address, and we're going to turn it over for questions in a minute, is um, what, what, you know, I think Nyman uh, works with farmers that value their independence. I think people who buy Nyman Ranch products value independent farmers. Um, and the food retail supply chain, you know, has not always, um, you know, found a way to work directly with producers or has not always found ways to, you know, give the farmer the, the best value on the dollar that, that they possibly can. Um, even though I think customers in general like the idea of, of supporting producers directly or as directly as they can. Um, and so I'm wondering, as we start to see things shake out, you know, will we see, um, you know, it's been a very embattled time for big meat packers, but it's also been a, a time of, of really strong profits. Will we see sort of consolidation in the, in the, um, in the industry? Or, or as people are excited for to try new things and are cooking more and having new habits and the pandemic itself just makes us question everything that we know, right? And all the received wisdom that we've, that we've sort of accepted over the years. Are we going to see more opportunities for, um, for you know, producers and retailers to, to work more directly together? And, and one aspect of that also may be um, the, the scarcities that we've seen. Um, certainly, this is not the case across the board, but some of the smaller supply chains uh, did demonstrate some resiliency um, throughout this. So, so I wonder too if some retailers are thinking, okay, we need to find a way to diversify and not just be dealing with like one meat distributor or whatever. 
Um, but whatever it might be, I'm curious what folks think about this sort of, yeah, retailer supplier relationship and, and how that might change uh, as a result of some of this shifting, shifting terrain that we've seen. I'd say one of the biggest trends we've seen in the in the whole fresh side over the last five years has been something we'd call I'd call transparency. And yeah, you know, I think like a Nyman Ranch and and even Butcher Box and other other companies like that um, are exceptionally well positioned around around that aspect. And what what transparency means is it's the desire of consumers to know more about how their food is raised or grown or made. And it and it's just opening it up all the way there from how it's packaged to you know, to how the animals were cared for. So when Mike talks about telling a story around that or how Nyman has uh, the, uh, you know, the independent farmers, that story is very powerful because consumers are searching it out and not just boomers, but I think Gen Z millennials, they're used to popping it up on their phone to go find out the origins of, of how that animal's raised. If you take it out to the, uh, take it out to a produce example, just to take it out of the meat side, um, yeah, there, you can, in, in many cases, you can go to a strawberry package in a store, click on a, a QR code, and it'll take you back to the field, how it was picked, what the conditions were, et cetera. So the expectation is from a consumer side that more and more of that is open, that they can find that information and they value it and they will pay more um, and support the brands that get behind and do that. So the more open a brand can be, the more open a, uh, a product can be, whether it's a meat packer or whether it's um, something else, the more benefit it is from the consumer side because it helps drive sales. And that's something our research has shown over and over that the, the manufacturers and retailers that get behind that trend and support those kind of products grow faster than ones that don't. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that topic before we, we take some questions? Yeah, I have a... Yeah, and you guys might all want to address it. It's, it's, it's a big... Yeah. <laughs> no, virtuals, yeah. uh, virtuals are big right now. We're doing a lot of virtual seminars for education in all different departments. We have a master summit, Madeline Trapan, that's building every every day, every time, every week we do it, they get larger and larger. We can get wine bakers from Europe. We can get all throughout the different producers. And when you go to a family farm of one of Nyman Ranch's um, partners, you fall in love and you want to support it. And you know, our guests, we're the world's safest grocery store. If you come in our, we run a hospital right now. Um, we really take care of our guests our team members. We have full service meat departments. A lot of our competitors, conventionals, went to self package only. Um, and our average guest spends about five minutes at a meat counter, not 13 seconds, because they're an independent, higher quality meat department. So they want to see the different cuts, talk to the butcher, still even COVID. Because we have less guests in the store, they can social distance. Remember, people are sending one person instead of a family of five to the store. And when they do come in, they have a big list and they're going to fill that card up and come less frequently. So again, that's a COVID trend. So it's a change. But I want to tell you, Nyman Ranch has been on the phone with us daily or weekly during this time of pandemic, making sure that we know if we're not going to get our meat, if they're going to have a shutdown in one of their slaughterhouses, they've been fantastic. So all of our vendors, our suppliers, we actually, our relationship went up a thousand percent during this time because we're all in this together. And I love the communication I got from the Nyman team. And my loyalty to them is even stronger today. And what everybody knows that buys Nyman. Buys Nyman. Nyman. Sure. 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 Great. Yeah, thanks. Let, let's hit Kevin and, the, and then Mike. Well, I, I think what's interesting is the, the connection be, between millennials and empty nesters. This has been a hard thing, our boomers, that that people, you know, they seem so different at one point in time, but what's fascinating is they're both connoisseurs. They really want to know how leather's made, how wine's made. Now, one group might like wine in a, in a milk box and another might like it in a wine bottle. Um, they're very interested in craft and you see it with craft beers. You see it, as I said, with leather and shoes. People really want that story rich kind of experience. And so I think there's so much interest in knowing the producer and maker. That is the big focus. And every time we've done a concept that way, it, it is done really well. What's fascinating to me is I work for a lot of traditional CPG companies and their sales are way up too. Um, some of them were near bankruptcy. You can, you can kind of look and figure that out, but some were almost done and all of a sudden they're doing great. But when you ask those executives how they feel, they'll tell you our sales are up for all the wrong reasons. 
people are buying this stuff, but they're not loving it. And they are terrified the second we go back to some less panic mode that people are saying, I don't want to eat that packaged product way in the back of my cupboard. I just bought it just in case. Uh, the future, and Chris hit on it, the future is transparency. But, but I, I want to reiterate, I think it's about connoisseurship and knowing your producer and maker. If you dig down into the fears of consumers, they have a fear of uh, 1984, one giant company making all their products. Uh, they're, they're terrified of this Glaxo chemical food. And, and to some degree, Amazon has this. If you're buying everything from Amazon, you're getting everything from one place or say four entities. And so as much as the pandemic kicked off some reactions, give this a little time when we consolidate food to just four major operators, watch the public's reaction to that. The public is not gonna like that. And I say that as say grocery stores die or other things happen, you're going to see the public say, now wait a minute, who's in charge of my food? This is gonna change. It'll be our next kind of paranoia. Yeah. Mike, did you have a thought there you wanted to share? Yeah, I do. I yeah. think, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges for any retailer right now is trying to predict what Q3 and Q4 look like, right? So we saw this huge spike of demand in the, in the spring and now it's been softened. I mean, it's still 15 to 20% above where it was in terms of meat, but it's not 90 to 100%. And nobody wants to be caught flat-footed where their customer is unable to go to the store and purchase what they're looking for, right? So my biggest concern, especially for a brand like Nyman, is making sure that the retailers are willing to keep their commitments. Because at the end of the day, and I've, see, I've, I've seen Trip and Chris get up on stage and talk about how important it is for the farmers to hear that we are gonna buy that pig no matter what. They need to hear that from the people purchasing the product as well, right? So we as ButcherBox are saying to Nyman, here's our projection. We have no idea if we're right or we're wrong, but here's our projection. And by the way, we commit to purchasing that meat. Like we're going to buy that meat. I'm concerned about retailers who are were left were left flat-footed, and how they respond and how they make commitments for for going forward. And to me, that is the partnership that needs to happen right now. Or or these small brands are going to be in trouble because they they cannot hold. You know, only super large companies can hold all this inventory and hope for the best. Um, and so, you know, I think for everyone to think about is how do you. We, we all want to keep this going. We all want to be in Iowa next year. And how do you make sure that Nyman is well positioned to be able to handle the pandemic with, with the retailers? Um, I, I think that's a fascinating kind of question. We need to lock our arms and get through it together. Yeah. Well, so let's do some audience questions. One sort of relates directly to that. Um, someone's asked us, are your customers concerned with animal welfare or food safety as it relates to the pandemic? Uh, slash the ability to slaughter animals on schedule. So obviously one thing we have seen is, is animal welfare concerns around these supply chain bottlenecks that have led to culling um, and, and so on. Um, is, is that something you guys have picked up on? Has, has, this, has the animal welfare aspect sort of reared its heads in, in people's uh, minds during this or are they too worried about their own welfare you know, in this time of uncertainty? I think I'll, I'll take it and jump in and, and kind of let others build. I'd say short term, the animal welfare concern receded for at least a, a broader portion, but it's still there. In other words, it's it's in their minds. It's right now they're simply just buying and testing more products. But I, I would expect once recession recedes a little bit and you know the, the, this pattern of behavior extends another six months, it's yeah. going to come back and it's probably going to come, come back in a bigger way than it had been before. In other words, Gen Z now is five years older. You see millennials um, now with kids and it's not just about buying organic baby food. Now it's now they run households and many will have teenagers soon. So how they buy product and how they, what they care about, it'll matter a lot more. Yeah. Uh, so, and so part of it is I would expect that, so short term today, not as much, but it's it's coming back and it's still there. Yeah, I'm going to keep going. Um, but if anyone wants to touch back on any of these questions, just feel free to feel free to do so. Um, this question I just want to ask because I don't know what it means, and so I'm really curious. It says, "What shifts are you seeing in skew rationalization within the meat department at retail? What's skew rationalization? Does anyone know?" Well, it's, we count it by items. So we see when we see item counts um, in the in the supermarkets about what's sold, we're we're seeing it run probably at ten to fifteen percent less. So there's 
less selection of individual items all the way across that meat case. So if you sort of closed your eyes and thought about a self-serve meat case and even the behind the glass, um, there's just fewer items there. It doesn't mean that there's less meat overall. It just means that manufacturers or, or the processors are running um, more of their main items overall. And the same thing's happening for, you know, across almost every category. You know, canned soup, you're, it, it's really hard to go find. If you, if you have a, you know, a niche flavor soup that you really love, you may not find it um, simply because it's not efficient for those manufacturers to run. And they're really just trying to keep the, the shelf stocked in many cases. Um, kind of so, whether the, yeah, so, so whether it's hot dogs or soup or, or you know, pork chops, it, it's, you're seeing that kind of cut. Behind, cool. behind this, the, the meat counter, what happened was a lot of people were short on staff, so they couldn't cut as many different types of meat. So they're just going after the faster ones. In our stores, we went after the restaurant industry and hired a lot of chefs to become cutters. And our selection was as large during COVID as before. So we had a lot of guests buying all the different cuts because they were getting, you know, tired of the same meat every day. So they wanted different types and they were trying different varieties of meat or chicken or, or seafood that they never did before. Got it. Um, okay, let's see. We've got five minutes left, maybe time for two questions. Um, what changes would you like to see in the meat processing sector that support your needs in retail? That may be uh, for, yeah, for Mike or, or Mark, but yeah. Um, we, if you look at COVID cases and you look at the plants, um, the plants that are much bigger processing more animals have had the most trouble. Um, and that uh, is, you know, due to lots of people working there. It's due to living conditions. It's due to uh, the number of people packed into a, a space and lines moving quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, so we think that uh, smaller, um, more nimble processing facilities are ultimately the answer. Um, there's a few, uh, a few things making their way through the government to try to, you know, support that, especially on the beef side. Um, you know, I think uh, that's an area where the, the industry is consolidated. And uh, one of the challenges with the consolidated industry is, for example, if you're trying to um, process a, uh, a pasture raised pig, um, there's not a lot of chain space out there really anywhere to, to do that. And you're, you're trying to convince the conventional people to let you run your animals uh, at off times or let us take this half of a day. And that's been very, very hard to do. Uh, it's one of the main reasons I believe why um, uh, claims based, but especially grass fed beef has, has not been able to um, compete in this country is because there's like literally no place to, to process them. Um, and so I think we need to see more small plants, more small slaughterhouses. Um, uh, and, and hopefully this is a wake up call for people to like actually try to make that happen. Yeah. Okay, uh, last question, I think. Um, do you think local indie stores will grow as com communities want to support local? Um, maybe a, another way of, of, of framing that might be, you know, um, will we see more smaller scale specialty retailers or, you know, or things like butcher box, you know, neat kind of niche, uh, solutions for targeted at a specific customer who wants a, a, a really specific product. Um, or will this, you know, as, as chaos sometimes does just sort of benefit, uh, the, the entities and organizations that already have the most power. I can take that. Um, as an independent, you know, if you look at the life cycle of independence, not a lot of them go out of business. I mean, the bigger chains that go public, they have difficulties and stuff like that. But my brother and I are very, very uh, proud of the independence in the United States. Uh, the grocery store industry, especially the independents, are becoming very respected. I became one of the most popular people in town. People were texting me, calling me. <laughs> they, they were just happy that we're supplying their families because they, they know us. So I think that the independents are, are only going to thrive um, going forward. The big boxes will always be there, the Amazons and Walmarts. There's a, there's a need for everything, but I think the independence will never go away. Not, not if I, you care and love what you do. And I would say from, you know, we've been in business 30 years and the, the small local and regional business has just been growing. Um, it was growing pre-pre-pandemic and it's really growing now. And what's super exciting is grocery stores are having a moment now. 
where communities really value and appreciate them. Um, the love for grocery stores is at an all time high. And I think it goes back to this idea of the sense of security and people feel really comfortable knowing they can go down to their local market and get some food. And, you know, if you go to other countries that don't have a lot of meat or don't have a lot of grocery products, you can see that panic where people will be waiting in line to get food and walking into a grocery store and seeing food really, really is, makes people comfortable. And I, I think it's also worth saying that the big commodity game of grocery is a horribly terrible, unfun game to be in. It's all about efficiency. It's all about the lowest price. It's a, it's a death match of who will play chicken where the local and regional ones are able to charge a slight premium for a better value equation. And it is a much better battle to be in. It's, it's a lot more fun. And so the growth of small local regional stores for us is, is, is off the charts in comparison to the big box. The big box is going to get more and more commodity. They're playing Amazon's game, mm -hmm. except they can't be as big as Amazon. So imagine that. You have this big ship and you're fighting against Amazon. It's a very difficult thing. Uh, I mean, the one thing we didn't talk about is the trend of smaller stores. I'm doing, a, I'm doing stores that are now 10,000 square feet, which means we're taking out 40,000 square feet of other people's products. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that's a lot of editing, a lot of skew editing. Yeah. Um, if we have time, you know, one more sort of just poignant question came in that I thought I'd post to you and maybe a bit on a darker note, but um, <laughs> this says, will the millennials and Gen Zs be able to afford these high-end products with this recession that's looming? So the whole question, the whole time we've been talking about, you know, this interest and delight and good food and, and novelty and cooking well, um, certainly I think we can see that, but we're also seeing this economic crisis. And I do think, you know, millennials and, and Gen Z folks uh, generally speaking, want to spend money on food. You know, they spend a high proportion of their income on food, but there's no mistaking that people are in trouble. Um, so how, how do we make sense of, of, of the, those sort of two, you know, countervailing forces? I think it's sort of a mistake to kind of lock in on millennials and Gen Z, you know, as, as primary buyers. So if we, when we segment the entire U.S. based on um, desire to buy organic, natural type products, um, the second biggest segment is what we call enlightened environmentalists. And those are older, older people, you know, retired or getting close, um, usually a little bit more educated and they have, have means, but they're the second biggest consumer set um, in terms of activity. Um, and, a, and also just kind of consider that upper income Gen X are the parent or Gen X are the parents of Gen Z for the most part. So if you think about upper income Gen X, they mimic a lot of the, the Gen Z behaviors in some ways because they influenced them over time. So that's a long winded answer. And I apologize for saying older people buy claims based meat too um, on that bit. And, and from that side, and they will have, um, yeah, they, they will have means. So it's not about just a 23 year old trying to buy something. We've been shocked well, I think from the how yes, much yes, premiums they pay. Sorry, just we we continue to be shocked uh, with the premiums the millennials pay. We keep waiting for it to go down, but if you look at the Netflix accounts and the game accounts and the iPhones and the Postmate charges, they're paying premiums left and right, and we can't seem to. Uh, we're trying to figure out when that's going to go out, and when we drill into it deeper, we find it, it's going out in terms of they're not buying cars, they're not buying fashion items, they're not buying trips, uh, they're not doing restaurant experiences, they're not doing bar experiences and liquor. These things are categories that our other generations had, and so we have not seen it happen yet in younger generations. And uh, I mean, we're a long way from soup lines if you still have an iPhone. Yeah, and I think Kevin, you hit on it. I just the, the experience of buying certain products that, and having the meal around that is a big part to the younger generation. So you're right, they will spend differentially on things that matter, especially experiences or, or things that they truly value. And, and you nailed that they don't buy certain items as well yeah. um, that traditional cut. generations might have. If they have to make cuts, they'll, they won't cut food. They'll figure out something else to afford the higher quality food for themselves in portion size, you know, they don't, Sometimes you don't need eight ounce pizza steak. You can go four ounces per person and eight ounces of vegetables. Our food portion size in restaurants, you know, has really made people think they need to eat a lot more than they really do. So you need really healthy uh, with right proportions and, and, and you can afford it. 
food is still very, very inexpensive in the United States, especially. We've, yeah, thank you all. We, we've got to wrap. Um, uh, this has just been a really enlightening, fascinating conversation. So thanks for our panelists and thanks everyone who, who tuned in online. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the, the, the uh, part of a series of events from Nyman Ranch for their Hog Farmer Appreciation Celebration, which really is an amazing thing to do uh, in real life, but it's also been exciting uh, virtually this year as well. Uh, the next event, I believe, is next Wednesday. Um, that's actually Animal Welfare came up on, on that, um, on this uh, session, and that will be the, the topic of that. It's on, on levers for change to improve animal welfare. Um, so you can visit nymanranchfad.com for more information. Thank you all so much for your time, um, to the panelists, to Nyman for having us, and for everyone who tuned in. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.